And welcome to The Well here at STSA, where we are in week two of a series called Starting Small. And if you missed week one, I encourage you to go online on our YouTube page or our website, stsa.church, and make sure that you get caught up because we had a very important message last week about habits and systems. But leaving that aside, I want to start today by asking you a question. I need everyone to participate in their mind. You don't need to say your answers out loud, but I need you to participate in your mind. You woke up this morning, whatever time you woke up, what was the first thing you did when you woke up? The very first thing you did when you woke up. You, if you're like me, first place you head is to the bathroom. And when you went to the bathroom, did you go to the bathroom and then brush your teeth and then shower? Or go to the bathroom and then shower and then brush your teeth? And when you stopped by that, when you were on your way to the bathroom, did you stop and check your phone? And if so, what app did you check first? What was the second? You go Facebook or email or the gram? Like, what is it to check first? After you got out the shower, you got dressed. How did you get dressed? What's your system? Did you go top to bottom or bottom to top or inside out or outside in or how do you get dressed? Okay. Some people go sequentially. Some people go like from the interior to the exterior. Exterior. Did you, when you put on your shoes, you put on your left shoe first or your right shoe first? When you put on your makeup for the ladies, was it hair first and then makeup or makeup then hair? When you answered or picked up, or I'm sorry, even when you started the first moments of your day, when I said when you woke up, did you snooze? Did you snooze once? Did you snooze twice? Snooze three? Some of you are still kind of in the state of snooze right now, maybe, potentially. <laughs> I'll bet you two things about all those questions that I asked you. I bet you, number one, most of you, the majority of you are sitting here right now are saying, I don't have the faintest idea. Most of you don't realize what the first thing you did in the morning was. Most of you did all those things subconsciously. Whether you put on your left shoe or your right shoe first, you don't have the faintest idea. Whether you did your hair or your makeup first, you probably don't remember. I bet you first that you don't know what you did. But I'll bet you second another, another, another idea, another thing that I believe. I bet you that even though you don't know what you did, I bet you did the exact same thing yesterday. And I bet you do the exact same thing tomorrow. And I bet you, if you put on your left shoe before your right shoe today, that you will put on your left shoe first tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. I bet you if you shower, then brush your teeth, that you will shower, then brush your teeth tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. I bet you that when you brush your teeth, you don't sit there every day and say, you know what? Where am I going to start today? I'm going to go start in the top left today. I bet you, you just kind of start where you start. Like you don't think about it every day and say, I'm going to start in the middle today and kind of go from the inside out. You just do what you are programmed to do. I bet you even right now where you're sitting, I bet you when you walked into church today, if your seat was open, it may not have been open, but if your seat was open, you naturally walked to the exact same seat and you would sit in the exact same seat every single week if it was available. And that leads me to a conclusion, which is the premise for our, our message here today. That conclusion is that much of what we do, even though we don't realize it, much of what we don't do isn't the result of conscious decisions, but rather it's the result of subconscious habits. Much of what we do isn't a, hmm, should I do this or should I do that? We don't make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis as much as we think we do, but rather they're done subconsciously. And I'll give you an example. How many times have you gotten in the car, started driving, and then said, where am I going? How many times? And you think about it logically. If you don't know where you're going, how did you get this far? But subconsciously, you know where you're going. You get on the road, you go through the thing, and you subconsciously. How many times? I'll give you the opposite. On your way home after a long day at work, you get in a car, you remember that, and then all of a sudden, you're at home, and you don't remember anything from the drive. You don't remember anything. Did you listen to radio? Did you have a phone? Like, you don't remember anything from it. You were just kind of on autopilot. Because much of what we do is the result of conscious decisions, but rather subconscious habits. A study from, in 2006 from Duke University estimated that up to 40%, 40% of the daily choices and actions that we take, up to 40% are not conscious decisions, but rather the result of our subconscious habits and patterns or systems, meaning we do them on autopilot. And the reason why they concluded is because our brains, okay, are the most complicated piece of machinery on the planet, and our brains are extremely efficient. God made them to always be seeking more efficiency. So what our brain likes to do is find patterns. 
Okay, you get in the morning, like I said, the first time you brush your teeth, you thought about it, dentist told me start here, go this way in circles, whatever. So your brain sees, ah, he did it on Monday, he did it on Tuesday, he did it on Wednesday. So your brain says, stop using energy to think about that. And it creates like a pattern, it encodes it in there, that as soon as you pick up the toothbrush, you know what to do without thinking. Your brain conserves the energy for other matters. And this is important for us because if 40% of our actions happen subconsciously and 40% of the things that we do happen with us thinking about them, this can be a great detriment or a great advantage if we learn how to take advantage of it. I'll give you an example. Think back to when you started learning how to drive. Think back to the first time you got behind the wheel. You took the driver's ed, okay, you did the six months, whatever it was, and then you got the keys for the first time. You're 16 and three months or whatever it is, the age where you're, where, when you were getting your license, and the first time you drive. Compare the first time you drove to how you left the house this morning in your car. Remember the first time we got in a car? All right, we got in. Okay, it took us 10 minutes to get in, okay, because we get in, okay? Well, first of all, we don't know how to, we get in, and we get in, and then we have to adjust the seat. No, nope, a little more. No, nope, a little back. Okay, and it's got to be just right, right? And if it's not, we're like, ah, cancel the mission, abort the mission. See, something's wrong with the seat. I don't feel comfortable leaving port with this. Then we adjust the mirror, and every mirror we adjust it, okay? And it's like a 20 minute process to adjust it. We get the seat belt, it's a little tight around the hips, so we loosen it a little bit. Okay, we wiggle and we make sure that it's just right. Radio off, okay? We don't want air conditioning, we don't want windows, we just want to be able to focus. We get in the car, we turn the ignition, it takes us forever to find where the key goes in. Remember back when we used to use keys for cars? Okay, we had to find where the key went in. Turn it on. Then we put it in R. Of course, we go too far, so we go to N. Then we put it back and we go too far to park. And we finally get it in the R. How many times do we turn around? 15 times. We turn this way, we turn this way, we turn this way. We back out ever so slowly. What happens when we get to the end? We come to a complete stop. And we try to put it in D, and again, we go too far, then we go too far this way, and then we finally get it, and then we go forward. Versus how'd you leave today? You walk into the car, you got your phone, okay? And you are opening the car door, getting in, putting in the address, cranking up the music and the AC, all while backing out, while buckling up. You never come to a complete stop. You got that roll into P thing, roll into D thing going, and you head out in two seconds. Why? Because your brain has encoded, has made a pattern that says, don't think, don't put any thought into it, it's on autopilot. Think about it like blazing a trail through the wilderness. You got really high grass, so the first time you have to step over it and you kind of blaze the trail and you cut the stuff, but after you've gone through it several times, then it's like a beaten down path, okay? Then you don't have to do anything, you just kind of go where the path leads you. Our brain does the same thing. That's the power of habits and power of systems. That's why the quote that we saw last week, Aristotle, pretty smart guy, said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. We are what we repeatedly do. So if you repeatedly smoke, you're a smoker. If you repeatedly drink, you're a drinker. If you repeatedly party, you're a partier. If you repeatedly give, you're a giver. If you repeatedly pray, you're a prayer -er -er. We are what we repeatedly do. And this is important because so much of life happens without us thinking, it kind of happens on autopilot. If we want to change our lives, we need to learn how to change those subconscious habits and patterns that are controlling us. If, for example, you're in the habit First thing you do, you check your phone. You wake up in the morning, first thing you check your phone. First thing you do is you check your phone. You check your phone first thing. You use it as your alarm clock. It's right by your bed. It is your habit. First thing, you check your phone. And then I tell you, pray first thing before you check your phone. It is going to be extremely difficult for you. And it's not gonna be easy. And you're gonna say, why can't I just pray? Father Anthony said pray and prayer should be easy. And I love the world and I love my phone. No, maybe not. Maybe you just got a bad habit that we need to start a new good habit in the place of that. If you're used to cup of coffee, cup of coffee, cup of coffee. I don't start work till I have a cup of coffee. I don't start my day till I have a cup of coffee. And then I say, you should fast. And you should not drink coffee before you come to church, take communion. Or when we're in Lent, you should fast. And you would say, I, I want to, but I just can't. It's really, really hard. Maybe I'm just not designed to fast or I'm just a bad. No, you just got a bad habit in place. And if we can replace that habit, you can never get rid of habits. You can only replace them. Cannot remove, only replace. Then we can find success. 
Same thing. You're used to eating dessert. You eat a bowl of ice cream after dinner. This one from experience. It is extremely hard. You say, just don't eat the ice cream. Just don't eat the ice cream. It ain't that simple. If I've been eating ice cream after breakfast, lunch, and dinner since I was 20 years old, okay, then I'm not going to be easier for me to just stop eating the ice cream. Your habits control more of your life than you realize. And what we want to talk about today is how to make sure those habits are working for me, not against me. Your habits are powerful. We need to make them working for me not against me, and we're going to discuss how to do that today. Just as a reminder, kind of recap what we talked about last week, our key thought for this series is this. Our key thought is successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. That's the premise of this series, is that everyone, like we talked about last week, everyone has the best goals. Everyone has the best. Like if I took a survey of all of our goals, they're probably going to be pretty much the same. Everyone want to eat healthy. Everyone want to exercise more. Everyone want to read more and watch TV less. Everyone wants to do the pretty much the same things. Everyone wants to yell less at their kids, spend less time online. We all have the same goals, but we have vastly different results. And the reason why is not because our goals, but our systems. Because what we talked about last week is you will not rise to the level of your goal. You will fall to the level of your system. That's why systems are so important. If you get the right ones in place, they will lift you up towards your goal. And if you got the wrong ones in place, you can make all the goals and all the resolutions and all the promises you want. You got the wrong systems in place, you will naturally fall to that level. But the question for today is how to get those right systems in place. How do I do the things I've always wanted to do? I always wanted to eat healthy, but I never seem to make it. How do I do that? How do I get more exercise? How do I establish a habit of exercise? How do I establish a habit of get up early and not snooze 17 times every single morning? How do I establish a habit of pray with my kids or pray with my wife? How do I establish those habits? Well, I want to tell you that if you want to start good habits, it's not as hard as you may think it may be, okay? Here's our key thought for today. And if you can get this one down, I promise you, this will allow, put you on a course for life to establish good systems for the rest of your life. You keep in mind this. The key to establishing good habits is to aim high, but start small. Aim high, but start small. Aim high, dream big, shoot for the stars. I agree. Set high goals, for sure. I'm all about that. Y'all know me. I love the goal setting. I love to set high goals. However, our problem is is that we don't know how to translate those high goals into small steps. We think big goals needs big steps. I'm gonna read the Bible in a year. You ever read the Bible before? You own a Bible? Or you just get the free one from the hotel? Like you own one? I'm gonna read the Bible in a year. I'm gonna read 15 books this year. Okay, that's a great goal. How many did you read last year? None, but this year's 15. Zero sugar, zero sugar. I'm gonna give up all sugar. Okay. That's very nice, but you grew up like I grew up thinking that that, that healthy drinks was like Kool-Aid and Tang. Anything that was orange or red was healthy, okay, because it just had a color of a fruit. So it's not going to be easy for you to go zero sugar. The problem is, is the aim high, the big goals take a lot of, there's a lot of inertia working against you at the beginning. You know, like the spaceship, okay, they say to blast a rocket into space. So much energy just to get it up off the ground. And once it's in orbit, it just kind of stays in orbit. But to get it off the ground requires so much energy. And it's the same with starting new habits. Like I said, you're in the habit of reading zero books per year. It's not going to be easy to get to 15. It's going to take a lot of working against the inertia. An object in motion stays in motion. Okay, an object at rest stays at rest. So you got a lot of years of rest. So you're going to require a lot of energy to get to that point. So we need to figure out all four, dream big. Aim high, shoot for the stars. We gotta learn how to start small though and small steps to help us build some momentum. There's a great verse from James chapter three, verse four and five. James says, look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires. Big ship, small rudder. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles. The same is true in your life. You got big aspirations, but sometimes it's small little decisions that will steer you, that won't get you there, but it'll steer you in the right direction and put you on the path to success. Then he says, on the negative side, I can burn down this whole forest with a tiny little flame, okay, that I put right here, burn down the whole place. There's a passage in scripture from the book of Zechariah, Old Testament prophet Zechariah, who was writing during a time, one of the low points in Israel's history. The people of God, 
the children of God, who God did so many miracles for them and brought them out of so many bad situations, well, they were in a pretty rough situation now. Their country had been taken by the bad guys and they were taken as slaves, as captives into a place called Babylon. And while they were in Babylon, they looked and they saw their mighty temple, okay, which was like representative of the people of God that God dwelt amongst them. Temple destroyed, city ransacked and burned. And all they had, the only thing the people of Israel had was the identity as God loves us, God fights for us. But now they're enslaved. So they don't even have that. They had nothing. People were discouraged. People were depressed. And Zechariah speaks to them in the midst of this. And he tells them, okay, he's speaking at a time where there's a guy named Zerubbabel. Say Zerubbabel. 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 It's a fun name in case anyone's pregnant. Zerubbabel, okay? <laughs> Please consider that one. You'll be unique. You'll be the only kid Zerubbabel in your class. A guy named Zerubbabel is inspired by God and says, God puts it on his heart. I'm going to go back to that place. Jerusalem, and I'm going to rebuild the temple. But this is a big task. Like y'all are, are, are slaves, and y'all got no army. Y'all got no nothing. And you're going to go back and lead this. So the people are like, ah, eh, I don't really know. And they don't really, they're kind of giving them a hard time, and it's, it's a waste of time. And Zerubbabel wants to do like this big thing. Zechariah the prophet says this. He says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. What he's saying there is, Zerubbabel, you see this great mountain, okay, this big, this big obstacle, but in front of Zerubbabel, it's no problem because I, God, I'm going to fight for him and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this great thing. Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. He shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. This is the aim high. Yes, we can do it. Zerubbabel can do it. We rebuild that temple. Who is what's a mountain in front of God? No problem. Watch the next verse. After aim high, watch the next verse. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands also shall finish it. Then you will know what the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? Who has despised the day of small things? What Zechariah is saying right here is, aim high. Let's rebuild the temple. Let's move mountains. Let's do big stuff. But it starts by putting a brick. And then another brick, and then another brick. And who has despised the day of small things? I'll tell you who has despised the day of small things. We despise it. We don't want to start small. We want to go straight to big. We want to go straight to from out of shape, can't do nothing. I'm going to run a marathon. Eh, okay, good luck. I'm going to read the entire Bible in a year. No, no, no. And we, we are the ones who despise it because we, like we talked about last week, we're impatient. We want results. We want quick. But that's not the way to lasting success. The way to lasting success is small. I'll say it this way. Never underestimate what God can do through one small habit. Never underestimate what God can do through one small habit. Never underestimate what God can do through one small habit. And the negative side of that is never underestimate what the devil will do through one small habit as well. But we'll keep it positive today. Never underestimate the power of one small. <clears throat> you know, Zerubbabel, when he went to start the temple, you know, Zerubbabel didn't finish the temple. Zerubbabel only laid the foundation. A guy named Ezra came many years later. So Zerubbabel, if your goal is aim high, build a temple, failed. But his goal was start small, do my part, success. And he laid the foundation for the next guy. Never underestimate what God can do through one small habit. John Wooden, you guys heard of John Wooden? John Wooden is, most, is, is, is commonly known and thought of as the greatest coach in college sports. Some say all sports. Okay, he coached UCLA back in the 60s, 70s, something like that. And John Wooden, in a 12-year span, in a 12-year span, won 10 championships. It's pretty good, okay? 10 championships in 12 years, and there was a time where his team won seven championships in a row, okay? Seven championships in a row, and during that span, not only they won seven championships, they won 1 88 games straight. Okay, that, mean, that encompassed several seasons where they didn't lose a game. Not that they didn't lose it in the playoffs. They didn't lose a game. John Wooden, greatest coach of all time, commonly regarded. John Wooden, every year, first practice of the season. What do you think he did? First practice of the season was focused on what? Shooting, dribbling, passing. First practice of the year, he always taught them the same thing. How to put on their socks and tie their shoes. That was the first practice. It was dedicated to putting on your socks and tying your shoes properly because he believed 
that it's in the details, that it's the little things that make the big things happen, that it's not the big things. Everyone wants to start with the big things. How do I dunk? How do I shoot threes like Steph Curry? Everyone wants the big things. John Wooden was, you start small in the details. Mother Teresa, maybe you know her a little bit better than John Wooden. Mother Teresa, it was, Mother Teresa did great things. Mother Teresa did great things. You know what Mother Teresa used to say? She said, there are no great acts, only small acts done with great love. That's what Mother Teresa said. Don't tell me I did anything great. I just helped the person in front of me. Small acts done with great love. Never underestimate the power of a small habit. And I guarantee you, find me. You go inside your hearts. Find me, anyone you admire in any area of life. Someone you admire as a parent, someone you admire in your career, someone you admire spiritually. Find me anyone you admire. And I guarantee you, if you examine their life at the root, you will discover small habits done consistently over time. I think for me, there's someone who I admire very much spiritually, very much spiritually, one of the role models I look up to. And this person, every year for the past 21 years, every year for the past 21 years, read the entire Bible in the year. In the past 21 years, read the Bible 21 times. I look at that and I say, man, I admire that. Man, I would love to be able to do something that big. Like I try to read every day, but man, that's big. How you accomplish something that big? You know what that person would say? The person said, I didn't do anything big. You know the only difference between me and you? This is what the person would say. The only difference between me and you is I set my alarm clock 15 minutes earlier than you. That's it. I set my alarm clock 15 minutes. And he's not even saying I sleep 15 minutes less than you. Maybe I go to bed 15 minutes less, earlier than you. That's it. 15 minutes. That's all it takes. That's the difference between me and him. The difference between us and that person who reads the Bible every single day. It's not big. It's small. Never underestimate the impact of small habits in your lives. And I'll prove it to you. <clears throat> Ask you another question. I'll prove to you that small things, small habits can have big outcomes. Small can have big. I'll prove it to you. Empire State Building. How much force would it take to knock down a building the size of the Empire State Building? How much force? How much energy? Like how hard would you have to push to take, what kind of equipment would you need Empire State Building, 103 stories. Okay, that's really high, 103 stories high. How much force? Well, I would pose to you that the only force needed to knock down the Empire State Building is a small little push, a tiny little push. You don't believe me? You ever seen the dominoes chain reaction where you push a domino and knocks down another domino? Knocks down? You've seen that one before? Okay, well, one scientist several years ago Tried to, tried to research this and said, hey, wait a minute. A domino can knock down another domino. This we understand, okay, if it hits it at the right angle. But you know what? A domino can actually knock down a domino that's bigger. And he came to the conclusion that a one-inch domino can actually knock down a 1.5-inch domino. Okay, one inch can't knock down like a 10-foot, okay? It would be too big. But a one-inch can knock down one that's 1.5 times its size. And then a two-inch can knock down a three-inch. A three inch. A three could knock, uh, let's go with the odds, okay? One to one point, uh, you know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> Do the math in your own head, okay? It could get me a little bit in trouble here. But each one can knock down one slightly bigger. Say, so what, what, bi what big deal? Well, let's watch, we're gonna watch a little video clip right now and you see the impact of a small push and what it can do in the end. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino it weighs about 100 pounds ugh, and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. Here we go.
The best is his reactions if he didn't know that was going to happen there, right? <laughs> you saw what I'm talking about. Now, we're going to watch another video clip right now with someone who, a group who kind of recreated this, this experiment, but in a much larger and much more fun way, starting with a two-inch, two-inch piece of plywood. Watch this video. That was like a Guinness Book of World Records, something like that. That second one right there was a two-inch piece of plywood that if that had continued, the 18th one in that string right there, okay? I think there was 13 there. 18th one would have been the size of the Tower of Pisa, 164 feet. The 23rd one in this chain would be the size of the Eiffel Tower. The 31st one in this chain would be the size of Mount Everest. And if you could actually line it up, 57 of these things, you know what you'd cover? A block so high is the distance between the earth and the moon. All from a two-inch piece of plywood. Never underestimate what God can do through one small habit. My question for you, what small habit, God-honoring habit, might set off a chain reaction in your life? What might it be? Like what small thing if you implement it faithfully and consistently, might change the trajectory of your life. For example, you say, I'm not going to snooze anymore. Small change. I'm not going to snooze. I'm going to wake up when the alarm rings the first time. I'm going to tell the alarm when I'm waking up, not the alarm time me when I, like, I'm going to decide when I wake up. What might that do? What chain reaction might that set off? Maybe won't solve all your problems. Maybe allow you to pray more. You always want to pray before you go to work. Maybe allow you to pray. You always want to eat a healthy breakfast, but you're always in a rush. Maybe allow you to eat a healthy breakfast. You've always wanted to be more relaxed, no, less road rage. Okay, well, maybe the fact that you get up on time, you leave on time, you're not driving in such a rush, maybe it'll put you in a better mood. Maybe it'll help you to stop being late to work and having to lie about why you were late and the dog ate my homework or whatever it may be. What small habit could set off a chain reaction in your life? How about another one? How about if you say, I'm going to make a small change in my diet. I'm going to drink water instead of coffee. That's it. Small change. I'm going to drink water instead of coffee. What chain reaction might that set off in your life? We know for sure it'll have health benefits. Okay, you'll be in better shape. We know that'll probably put you in a better mood. We know it'll definitely help your budget, which will then definitely help your mood. Okay, so what small change could have a chain reaction in your life? How about, for example, if you decide I'm going to open my Bible before I open Instagram? Small change. I'm not telling you not to check the gram because you got to check your gram and see what's going on on the gram. But all I'm saying is I commit to one small change. I'm going to check my Bible before I check my social media. I'm going to open my prayer book before I open the Facebook. All right. I'm going to make sure. How about, how about this one? How about every day I'm going to spend 10 minutes with my spouse? Every day, 10 minutes with my spouse, face to face, no phones, no distraction, just face to face. What chain reaction might that set off? There was a Navy SEAL who a couple years back, you may have seen the, the, the YouTube video, the video on YouTube. He said, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed every single day. That's what he said. It was a fantastic speech. Go, go, go Google that speech when you go home. If you want to change the world, make your bed every single day. And his point was this, is that when you start by making your bread, your bed, you reinforce the fact that little things matter, that the details matter that you don't take shortcuts, that you do the right thing even in small things which seem insignificant. And who knows, like we saw in the video, who knows what that small thing done consistently over time, what big thing it may do over the course of time. But the million dollar question, how do I know the right thing to choose? How do I know where to start? Like what I'm saying right here, the small thing could lead to a chain reaction, but you got to hit the right domino. You got to know, you got to make sure that the first domino is the right one. So how do I know where to begin? Well, let's go back to what we talked about last week for those who are here. Last week we talked about before we start with do, we start with who. So before we start with, I need to do this or I need to do this, we want to start with who do I want to become? So I'm not going to say, I want to pray every day. I want to say, I want to be a man of prayer. 
And I'm not gonna say, I wanna spend more time with my kids. I wanna say, I wanna be an involved father. And I'm not gonna say that I'm not gonna eat sugar. I say, I don't wanna have to take a break going up the steps, okay? I wanna be someone who can go up the steps without a half time, okay, around step six or seven. You start with who you want to be, and then you focus on what I need to do. So here's my question based on who you want to be. Based on who you want to be, what one habit do you need to start? Based on who you want to be. You say, I want to be a godly parent. Okay, what one habit do you need to start to be a godly parent? You say, I want to be a bold witness for Christ, an ambassador for Christ in my workplace. Okay, what one small habit that'll take you one step closer, not going to accomplish the goal, but take you one step closer to be that way. I want to honor God with my money. I want to honor God with my time. I want to honor God with my body and my health. I want to be a supportive spouse, not a negative. I want to be an encouraging parent. I want to be a light to this world. Like, who do you want to be? And what is one small step you can take in that direction? So no one should start by saying the small step is, I want to pray every day. The, small, the first is, I want to be a man of prayer. I'm going to pray every day. I want to be a focused person at work. I want to be productive. So the small step may be, take Facebook off my phone uninstall the social media off my phone. You may say, I want to be more in touch with my emotions. Then maybe the one step is, I'm gonna journal every single day to be more in touch with what's going on on the inside. Based on who you want to be, what is one small step you can take to get there? There's a great book written about habits called The Power of Habit. Anyone read The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg? Okay, great. If you read it, kind of a, the, a, a, one of the most important points in it is where he talks about the habit loop. I won't talk about it very much here, but it's, a, it's an important concept to understand is that all of our habits happen the same way. It's a cycle. And it begins with a trigger and then an action and then a reward. So there's a trigger, an action, then a reward, and the reward leads to the more of the trigger. So for example, the trigger is I see a cookie on a table. That's the trigger. I walk by and I see a cookie. And that leads to an action, which is eat the cookie. And that leads to a reward, which is feel yummy in my tummy. So there's a trigger, an action, a reward. The negative side, I walk by my kid's room. That's the trigger. And I see the disaster in my kid's room as if the hamper vomited this morning all the clothes out of it, okay? <laughs> so that's the trigger. The action, then I yell like a crazy person, okay? And just start screaming violently or whatever it may be, and I just start screaming. The reward is my kid comes and cleans his room, okay? So the trigger, an action, a reward. A trigger, an action, a reward. We usually try to change and control the action. And the whole premise of the book, The Power of Habit, is you can't. Once you've seen the cookie, the likelihood that you'll be able to control yourself, the willpower that I won't, well, let's just say that's led us all to where we are this day. Instead of fighting the action, we need to fight the trigger and we need to remove the cookie and we need to put positive triggers in our lives and remove the negative triggers. So just very simply, okay, I'll tell you two tips when it comes to, to, to how to start new habits, okay, dealing with the triggers. And the two, the two tips are, are, when it, are this. When it comes to the trigger, make it obvious, make it easy. Make it obvious, Make it easy. Make it obvious, that's the trigger saying, what I mean by that is, there's a science behind what you see in front of you is going to affect what you do. This is why anyone, okay, who's in marketing or who understands marketing or ever worked in a grocery store, you know that, 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 that the, 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 the companies, the products fight to get on the end cap, okay, the, the thing in the aisle. Okay, because those are the ones, it's just human nature. The science says, whatever's right in front of you, you're more likely to grab it versus, and there's even a science of where it is on the, on, on the shelf. Like usually the, 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 the people who pay the most for the shelf, it's those products right here. No one bends down to get the dumb thing at the bottom. Okay, who doesn't just put trash down there? No one goes all the way down there, okay? Or the top ones. But the stuff that's right in front of you, you are most likely to purchase the thing that is right in front of you. So if we're gonna make it obvious, we want to leverage this, this, this idea, the science, that things that are obvious, we do them more frequently. So if I want to have it, take my vitamins every day, don't put them in the back of the shelf in the cabinet. You're never going to get there. Put them on the counter right in front of you. You want to stop eating cookies, man? Get them off the counter. Put those things in the back of the shelf or give them to somebody when they come over. Let them take them away, far away from you. You want to read your Bible every day? I've always believed the key to a good quiet time routine in the morning is the night before. You want to read your Bible in the morning? Open it the night before. 
Leave it right there so that, it's, so that it's, it's calling out your name and screaming at you saying, read me, read me. We do the opposite. The Bible is buried under a book, under another book, being used as a coaster or, or some kind of nightstand or whatever it may be. And then we are to, oh, I had to get all the way down there. Now we're not gonna do it. And do the opposite with your phone. Don't put your phone, anyone, I know everyone, I know, I'm officially the old guy in the room. I know, like, get off my lawn. This is, I'm the old guy, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Don't sleep with your phone right next to your bed. That's the worst thing that you can do. And I know I say that and everyone's like, but how would we wake up? How would we possibly wake up in the morning? There's this thing called an alarm clock, okay? And I buy them for people all the time. You think I'm joking. There's several people here. I've bought them an alarm clock to get them away from their phones. Stop sleeping with your phone next to you. Don't make it so accessible. Put your phone in another room. I don't have the phone in the same. Why would anyone do quiet time, read the Bible or pray in the same room as their phone? That's committing suicide. That's the worst thing that you could possibly do for your life because the phone is gonna be screaming out your name. Make it obvious, make it easy. And things you don't wanna do, do the opposite. Make it more difficult. You wanna work out in the morning? Prepare your workout clothes the night before. Know exactly what you're gonna do. Second one, make the action easy. Make the trigger obvious, make the action easy. No one is allowed to walk out of here and say, I'm gonna read the entire Bible in a year. That's a bad goal. You know why? I mean, unless you're like already like in the habit of it, but I'm saying you're not allowed to go from zero to 60 overnight. Here's what's gonna happen if you say, I'm gonna read the entire, entire Bible this year. You're gonna get about three weeks in and then you're going to lose steam. And you're gonna go from every day to every other day and you're gonna get behind and then you're gonna get frustrated and then someone's gonna say in a year or two years after you've quit, say, hey, you should read the Bible. You're like, no, nah, nah, I tried, that, it didn't work. That's not for me. What's a much better thing? Don't say Bible in a year. Say Bible five minutes a day. You think you can do that? Five minutes a day, just five minutes a day. I don't know if anyone's ever heard uh, the, the Jerry Seinfeld about how he became a great comedian about building the streak. You guys heard this one before? Jerry Seinfeld, this is, this is ingenious. Jerry Seinfeld they asked him like how you became a great comedian so many jokes, whatever it was. He said that he made it his goal to write one joke a day. One joke a day. And then he created a calendar, okay? And he printed a calendar and every day he did a joke, he would create a red X. And then next day, red X, red X. And then there's like a psychology behind like, I don't wanna leave a day without an X because it looks so nice to get a streak going. You know, 13, 14, 15. So make a small goal and every day do it. And I promise you, if you can just say, I'm gonna read the Bible every day for five minutes, just five minutes, I guarantee you, you'll be much more successful long-term than say, I'm gonna read for a half hour a day. Or I'm gonna read the entire Bible in a year. Applies to everything. You wanna pray with your spouse. So many couples don't pray together. You wanna pray with your spouse. Don't start with a 30 minute prayer meeting. Don't start where, where, where she can just keep on going and going and going and going and going. And don't, sit, don't start with that. You start with simple. We don't know how to pray together because every time we go, it keeps on going it's like the Energizer Bunny and it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. You start simple. You grab your wife's hand and you say, before we go to bed, we're gonna thank God for one thing, just one thing. Thank you, God, for our health. Thank you for our house. Thank you that we didn't kill our children today. Like, thank you, God, just for one thing today. That's it. Start small. You say, I want to journal. Father Anthony talks about journaling and he's journaling and journaling. I want to get into journaling. Then, 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 but it's an overwhelming thought. I don't know what it means to journal. I don't know how to write novels and diary. No, just simple. Get a notebook and every day, write the date and write one sentence. Just one sentence. One thought that you have. One feeling that you got. One thing that you learned today. Just one thing. You want to lose weight? Eliminate soft drinks. You want to increase marital intimacy? Like I said, 10 minutes, no phone. You want to be a better parent? 20 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is. Go take a walk with your kids. Play. Start small. You want to get stronger? Do 10 push-ups a day. You say, I can't do 10 push-ups. Do five push-ups a day. I can't do five. Do one push-up a day. I can't do one. Man, just get down on the floor and get back up. <laughs> Start small. Anything that you can do to take a step towards who you want to become. And then you really want to take the next step? Write it down. And you write it down this way. Okay, if you really want to take this seriously, you write it down this way. You write, after blank, I will blank in order to become blank. After blank, trigger, I will blank action in order to become reward. So for example, after my alarm rings, I will wake up, 
sounds intuitive, but I mean, I know it needs to be spelled out sometimes. So that I can be a responsible adult. After I have my cup of coffee, which is like set in stone, so everyone knows when I have my coffee. Trigger, obvious. After I have my coffee, I will read my Bible for five minutes so that I can leave the house filled with the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God. After I eat my lunch, something you do every day, an obvious trigger, I will walk outside for 15 minutes so that I can get some exercise every single day. Successful people. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Program it into your life. I'm telling you, you can program anything into your life if you just do it consistently. Do it consistently. Do it consistently. You will get to the point. I'll tell you, like, for me, one of the things that, that, that I, I know I shared last week about some of the like funny systems that I have, okay, about like how I eat and how I change my toothbrush and people were like, oh, he's just joking and it's not, but okay, that's fine. That really is me and those are just kind of the ones that I'm not embarrassed to share, okay? Like I have a system for everything, but let me, let me tell you some of the serious systems that I got. Some of the ones that I've established and you say, Father Anthony is a great man because he does this. Honestly, sometimes it's harder to not do these things than to do them. One of the systems that I have, and I've been doing it for years, I get up first thing in the morning, I say a prayer. That's the first thing I do. Pour even the bathroom, and sometimes it's like code red to get to that bathroom, but the first thing I do, I get out my bed, and I gotta walk to the bathroom this way, and then I have a crucifix right here, cross with Jesus on the cross. For as I'm going, and sometimes it's like stumbling, okay? I turn, I pause, and I just say a short prayer, and it's usually, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us, boo. That's it. That's it. And that's programmed into me. Like I said, I'm sleepwalking through the night. I'm holy God. You know what I mean? I'm programmed. It is harder for me to not say a prayer first thing in the morning than it is to pray because that's programmed into my system. I talked a lot about phone. Let me tell you something about me and the phone. My phone goes into do not disturb every day at 10 p.m. You can call. You can text. I believe in this thing called voicemail. It's a very nice thing. I use it very often. I know a lot of people don't, but that's... that's because at 10 o'clock, that's like time for me to rest. That's time for me to connect with my wife. That's time for me to, to, to read. So I don't need the phone to be ringing after 10 o'clock p.m. Speaking of phones, I'll tell you another habit that I have, another system that I have. When I'm talking to a person, I don't check my phone. I'm sitting with you and we're talking face to face. I don't check my phone. There's an emergency. What's an emergency? Someone's dying. You don't call me, man. I can call 911. Why do you call me if someone's dying? That's not an emergency. And all my years of priesthood, everyone says it could be an emergency. Could be, I never had an emergency. I make it a habit. I'm talking to you. My phone buzzes. You just see me reach and just push like that. Other habits. Our family. Something we've been doing since, since Michael, who's my oldest, is now 14. Something we've been doing since the day he was born. When he first came back from the hospital, I should say, not the date. Okay? Since he first came back, we do family bedtime. We do family bedtime together every night. Okay? We don't, like, let me tell we do a lot of things wrong as a family, okay? We do a lot of stuff. You'd be like, we shouldn't do that. But there's one thing that, hey, we got right. And we started this habit that every day before we go to bed, it's not just like, okay, you know, I'm going to bed or I'm just whatever. No, no, no. We don't go to bed till we all gather together. We chat about our day. We read the Bible and we say a prayer. We've been doing this now ever since the beginning. And our punishment for the longest time with the kids, no bedtime. Okay, like if they misbehaved or something like that, no bedtime. Because that's like ingrained. Again, I have a 14-year-old son who doesn't know how to go to bed without doing bedtime. And I'm like, thank you, God. Like, this is great. I'll tell you another one. Married people, me and my wife never go to sleep apart. And I thought this was just kind of a given thing. But I know many husbands who will stay up late playing video games and the wife goes up to bed. I don't understand what that means. Me and my wife, we go to bed together every single day. Even when we're fighting and we hate each other's guts, we go to bed at the same time. And there'll be times, she's the shooter more than I am, well, I'll be out late. And she waits up for me. And you know, if she doesn't wait up for me, I'll just come in and she'll, she'll be so tired and I can sometimes come home so late. I'll sneak into bed and she'll say, why didn't you wake me up? She wants me to wake her up. Think about that. She wants me to wake her up. Because that's what we do. That's our system. We connect every day before we go to bed. We have hectic lives, but we don't go to bed without connecting with the most important person who is each other. I keep on going. One of my systems that was taught from a very young age I get a dollar in my pocket, 10% goes to God. I don't even consider it. I don't even think twice. 
Never is there a thought in my mind that the money that comes in belongs to me. The system is that at least 10% goes out, and that's just kind of the day-to-day. But if more comes in, more goes out. As God has blessed freely, you have received, freely give. Like, this is, this is a system. This is a habit. I'm not trying to, like, brag or say I'm great or anything. I'm just being honest. And I'm just telling you that who I am today is a result of these systems. Who I am? So you say, Father Anthony, your marriage. My marriage is a direct result of the systems that we have as a husband and wife. My relationship with my children is a direct result as the systems that I have as a, as a father. My spiritual life is a direct result of the systems I have spiritually. Just like my physical health is a direct result of the systems that I have for eating and exercise and things like that. You are, like, am I lucky? I'm lucky. You're lucky that you're connected with your wife. Is it lucky? You're lucky that you, uh, your kids, is it lucky? Like, is it lucky or is it systems? I don't believe in luck. I believe that successful people do consistently what other people just do occasionally and then call it luck. I don't believe in luck. I believe in systems. I don't believe there's accidents. I don't believe anyone stumbles into success spiritually, relationally, financially. I don't think you stumble into it. I think you program it into your life through habits and through systems. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Jesus says, he was faithful in what is least, is faithful also in much. He is unjust in what is least, is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Faithful in least, ruler over much. And there's another verse, okay, in Matthew 25, it says the same thing in a little bit more positive way, which is, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. You did a few things really well. You were really consistent in those small habits. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter the joy of your Lord. So, how to start a habit. Aim high, but start small. Never underestimate the power of small. Never underestimate the power of small. You answer the question, who you want to become. And then find one small thing that you can do to step in that direction. Just a small thing. And then every year, you're going to build on that. As I was preparing this, I was reading about one pastor who says that every year he starts a new habit. Like every year, a small habit. And I love that idea. I love the idea of this is the year that I'm going to just focus on one small habit. And every year, and he said he's been doing it for like you know, 30-something years. And I just thought to myself, man, imagine the impact. Like some of you people here, y'all in your 20s are like, you know, still in diapers, whatever it may be. Like, imagine the impact. You're in your 20s. Imagine the impact that over the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you add one small habit. Imagine the impact that could have in your life. You'll never do big things in a year. But man, if you can do a small thing every year, that's where I want to be. Last verse, leave you with this. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Two things I know in life. I don't know much, but I know two things. Number one, I know God wants to do big things in you and through you. I know that for a fact. God wants to do big things in you and through you and same with me. Fact number two, I know that those big things that he wants to do always begins with small steps. My hope or my, my question to you, okay, that I leave you with this question. It's what small thing does God want you to do today so that he can do a big thing tomorrow? What small step does he want you to take today to open the door to him doing a big thing tomorrow? Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our heart We thank you, Lord, because you have big plans for our lives and there's big things you want to accomplish. And I thank you that like every one of us here knows, Lord, that that we're we're not at our full potential relationally or spiritually or physically, Lord. We're not where, where we need to be. And I pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us to figure out that small step, that small step that we can be consistent with, Lord, and that will open up the doors to you doing big things in our lives. We pray this in the name of your Son, with the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.